Hey everybody, Scout Crafty here again, TGIF, thank God it's Friday, you made it through another week, and uh, today we got a few things I want to talk about, again with the screwdriver theme we're kind of kitting on this week, I felt like fabricating one actually today, and we should have some fun with that, but uh, before, I thought we would start off with a little show and tell, I always do like to do a little show and tell here and here and there, and, and uh, today I want to talk about... Um, toys you know part of the toys I do love uh, I love toys of all types especially the older ones and do you remember when we were younger this is for some of the older audience out there um, <laughs> we used to have something called caps caps were uh, we had cap guns they were it came in paper rolls and um, this is again I'm dating myself but now caps go back to the uh, right after the, about the Civil War uh, is when uh, really caps and cap guns were popular all the way up in the, the 20s, 30s, and 40s. They were really popular, 50s, and then they started to die out in the, uh, you know, the 70s, things like that. But uh, cap guns, you know, had a big history here in the United States, you know, because uh, every kid had a cap gun and, you know, noise-making guns and things like that. And it was a lot of fun. And, um... They did change throughout the years, the different types, you know, there were the paper caps, then there were the plastic caps, and uh, but uh, the one I wanted to show you today is uh, is pretty interesting. I think you'll like it. Let's go take now a look. Now, many of you younger viewers will remember this type of cap gun. Uh, these were the kind of current uh, cap guns that they made, and these used a, uh, a little ring of uh, plastic caps that you would put on here, close it down, and, and you would have a... Uh, a firing like that and these are, are nice and they work well but the paper caps from years ago had a roll and they would feed through and they were kind of messy in fact a lot of times the uh the carb the uh, gunpowder residue would actually eat the zinc that the the uh, gun was made from so you don't see too many of these around but this one here is a nice example these are made in spain but you know we liked all kinds of noise makers back when you're a kid you know because uh that's just the way it was you like things that made noise fireworks firecrackers you remember these? This is for the older audience here. These here were, these were little like uh, sky bombs, they would call them. And you would, what you would do is you would take this apart like this and uh, you would insert a, uh, a paper cap. You know, you would rip it into one piece and slip that in here, tighten it up here. And then you would throw this in the air. And when it came down, it would make a, you know, this would ignite the cap and make a bang. Uh, I don't know if you remember these. These were pretty, you know, fun when we were kids. You buy them at the dime store or at the candy store. Uh, later on in the uh, late 60s and 70s, you know, they were doing away with They came out with these. These were like a cheaper, much cheaper. Remember these? This is when, during the 60s and 70s, the, you know, things started changing over from quality to plastic junk kind of things. And these were kind of a disappointment because you almost had to throw these down. You couldn't, these you just had to throw in the air and uh, they would explode. But these were kind of a little bit of a disappointment. But what I want to talk about today is something really cool. Okay, the cool item I wanted to uh, talk about today was this here. Have you ever seen one of these before? This is pretty interesting. This is called a super pneumatic, and this is a pistol, it was a toy. And you can see here it was uh, M LMCO was the company and it stood for Langson Manufacturing Company. It was established in 1923 by uh, uh, Otto Langus. He was the one that uh, uh, started the company. He came here. He was from Hungary. He came here in the early 1900s. He was a music teacher, actually, when he came here. But, you know, he had to do whatever he could to make a living. And he went to work at a, uh, a toy manufacturing company. He learned uh, art, a little bit of a tool and dye manufacturing. And then he uh, started, he was just a genius. He started inventing things for the railroad and other things. And, and, and that's when he opened uh, his company in 1923. And uh, later on, during the Depression, remember those are Depression years, he, they started making some toys and, and uh, he came out with a, uh, invented a, uh, a paper buster. And that's, uh, it was a, like a cap gun, because you can remember something, caps were uh, a little bit more expensive. And he wanted to come up with something that kids could still have fun and, uh, and use it. And the first one he invented, the uh, first gun that he invented, looked kind of like a space age ray gun. That's because Buck Rogers was the big, was all over the place. And the kids really loved the Buck Rogers and they wanted like ray guns. So he came out with that. And then uh, Fortune was very good to him because what happened in World War II, 
uh, none of the caps were being manufactured because of the shortage. They needed the gunpowder. So these, his uh, super pneumatic pistols, uh, were the rage, and that's where he really became uh, popular, and, and he really shot up to uh, a, a quite a big company back then. But, but well, let me tell you a little bit about how this gun works. And what this is, it's a pneumatic type gun, and um, using just a spring, a, a spring, and a, almost like a, a tire pump in here. There was a roll of paper, and they used to sell these. You can, or if you were poor, you could cut strips of newspaper, roll them up, make your own. The, news, the paper would come up through here and then feed through this back slot here. And what would happen is when you pulled the trigger, it would feed the paper up and it would make a popping noise like a cap would. Now listen to it without it. You hear it? Sounds like a typical, you know, like a cap gun would, something like this, you know, without the caps, right? However, if you wanted that bang, you would feed the paper in and, and, uh, and let me show you, I'm gonna feed a little bit of uh... What I use is wax paper and I'll give you a little demonstration on how this works. Okay, so what I did to demonstrate this is uh, I don't have any of that correct paper, but I used some wax paper, cut it into strip, wrapped it around a little bit of a, a piece of Delrin there. And uh, what that'll do is it's automatic feeding. So as I squeeze the trigger, this will catch this and feed it back. But uh, unfortunately you can't hear it here because the uh, the camera will cut off any noise that's too loud. So it just sounds kind of muffled. Here, listen. Now, to me, that sounded like a real loud bang, but to you, it sounded a little bit muffled. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand back a little bit, and I'm going to show you a few snaps first without the paper, and then I'm going to show you with the paper, and you can see the difference. Okay, this is without the paper. Now this is with the paper. Now you can see the self-feeding action is very ingenious how it works. And it is making a loud pop. That's pretty ingenious. It's just now, the amazing. funny thing is that there's a lot of people that, as as far as a collectible go, they're they're out there. There's a lot of them out there, but people don't really collect them anymore because there, there's something that the newer generation never even heard of them. So that's why I'm telling you about collectibles. How funny they could be, you know. Uh, back in the late '60s, '70s, you know, these were you know getting up there in price. People were collecting them, but now. There's a lot less people looking to buy them, you know, so uh, unless guys like me keep that alive, you know, and you think that's cool. That is pretty cool, right? Okay, so uh, let's get started with today's project and uh, talk okay, about Okay, for today's project, thought we'd do something fun. Uh, I, I told you I was in the mood for making something today. I was in the mood for fabricating something. Now, uh, I bought these years ago with the uh, intent of making uh, screwdrivers. It's just, uh, you know, you buy them in, uh, on Amazon get them in a 10 pack they're extra long screwdriver bits these are made in japan i believe makita makes these they run a little over a dollar a piece when you buy them like that and you can see here it says they're s2 which is usually high speed steel and ph2 that's a phillips number two nice little head it comes uh, kind of bead blasted but i think we're going to try and shine that up a little bit but um basically a simple job to simple easy to do you take a piece of stock this is what's fun when you come down to shop and you feel like making something take a piece of stock this is aluminum stock that i've had for years and i i always buy stock whenever i see it so pick up and we'll cut a piece and we'll make a handle and we'll slip this in we'll jb weld it in and uh and then we'll see what it comes out like. But I have an idea. I saw a machinist screwdriver years ago. That was the weirdest looking thing. But I said I always wanted one. I'm now my inspiration it. for this project came about. I guess about 30 years ago. I had to go to a machine shop. And there was a guy. A bunch of old time machinists in there. And one of the guys had a bunch of homemade screwdrivers. And he happened to be using one. And it was this weird. It was a short screwdriver. It was only you know about that long. And it was an ugly, you know, it wasn't a, a particularly attractive, but I remember it had knurling around the front. It had, you know, it kind of dipped a little bit here and he was spinning it like that. And I said, man, that looks really cool. And, uh, I, you know, he obviously made it. And I said, one day I always said I want to make one. So that's what we're going to do today. Okay. 
Okay, here we are at the lathe, and we cut off a small chunk of aluminum. Uh, you can see it's just about the right size, you know, but we got to clean up the ends here. Now, what's nice about a bigger lathe, one of the nice things about a larger lathe is that if you had a larger lathe, you'd be able to pass this one inch piece of aluminum through the chuck and not have to cut a piece off in this way, wasting less. But when you have a smaller lathe, you got to kind of deal with this because you can't really fit it through. So what we're going to do now is chuck it in the lathe, clean off the two ends. Now, see, this is a, a large overhang to have it this far out from the chuck to take off. So we got to take very small amounts off the end to clean it up. So that takes, that's another thing that about a small lathe that takes you a while. You can see here we, uh, it's running pretty good, but we're going to have to clean up this. So we'll flip it over and clean up the other side. Now we want to round off this corner here, um, this corner here. We want to round this off. Now a lot of times what you'll see is you'll see guys make a special forming tool, which will be a tool with a, uh, a half circle cut out and they'll bring it in straight in. But uh, the way I like to do it is I like to freehand it. Now you have two lower controls on the carriage. One is a feed that feeds the tool in and out, and the other one moves the carriage left and right. Now, what I like to do is I like to use them both in conjunction and drag the tool across the radius of the part and make my own radius. And this way I can make whatever I want just by using both at the same time. It takes a little practice and coordination, but I, I find it's very relaxing and a lot of fun to do. Check this out. Okay, so this will be the uh, what would be more or less the back end of the screwdriver here. You see that here? What, what a uh, what a nice look. Now we didn't obviously it didn't do a finish pass on there, but you can see it just got the roughed out, and that'll be the back of the screwdriver. We'll we'll uh, contour that more later. But what we want to do now is we want to have some bite on here because we're going to reverse it, put it in the chuck again, and start working on the business end where we have to drill the holes and everything. Now it's good practice to always do multiple cleanups when you're doing a job. You don't want the chips laying on the bed and whatnot. And the best thing to use is a vacuum, much better than compressed air. Okay, this is our final drill bit. This is a letter J drill bit. And what we did is we tested it on a piece of wood because we want to press fit because we're going to hopefully squeeze it in there with the dake. And uh, you can see how that's a nice press fit in there. And, uh, you know, with the, with the aluminum, it'll give a, a little bit more resistance. And with the JB Weld, that should uh, just keep it in there forever. Okay, you see we got that little nice taper at the end here. Now we want to hog out a little bit of this inside here to get that nice profile. And then the reason we left this hole that we did this first is because now I could put a live center. This is a live center, means it spins over there. And that'll support the work as I do two next important steps. One, as I contour this a little bit. And secondly, as I knurl this. So uh, let's see how that works out. Okay, this is coming very nicely, and uh, we have the handle the way we want it. Nice knurling on there, right? Now, uh, you can see here, it's ready to be pressed in. You see that? I mean, I could almost, by hand, start to press it in. You can see? So it's the right size hole. But what we're going to do now is two things. First of all, we're going to, you know, the sand, this uh, beaded finish. I think I like it. I don't know. I don't know if I like this better than... Uh, polished but I can always polish it later but what I want to do now is um I want to grind half of this key the bottom part under this uh, curl half of it off on so that way when it goes into the JB weld again it can't spin we want to make sure none of this can turn inside there 
Okay, uh, we ground down the two ends here. You see that like that? And that's so that when we put that in there, the JB Weld, it will not be able to turn. Plus, it's a press fit with those. Each one of these grooves will grab the side. It, it, it will not spin in there. Now, um, one thing you have to do is when we press this using the dake, which I'll show you in a minute, is um, we're gonna, we made a little Delrin out of a Delrin plug, just a little uh, hole drilled in there so we don't crush the tip. So the Delrin will press down the tip. And, uh, and then and what we're gonna do now is we're gonna alcohol uh, using alcohol and uh, some Q-tips. We're gonna clean everything really good to make sure the JB Weld can grip it. Okay, and... everybody's favorite, the Dake. Uh, let's take a look at the setup. We set this up ahead of time because we want the, we want the <laughs> epoxy to start curing. Okay, we filled this with uh, JB Weld. Not, not totally full because we have to leave a little air room. Uh, put a little around the shaft here and you can see this will press in like this. Now, what we'll do, we have a small piece of wood down there and again, we'll put this uh, Delrin cap over the top and then we'll press it down and uh, see what happens. I'll give you a better view in a minute once I get this situated. Okay, here we go. There we go. Now it's pressing in nice. We have uh, not even a quarter of a ton to press this in. It's just the right size hole. We're going to loosen it up again and we're going to recenter it again just in case. Okay, it's all recentered. We'll spin it around to double check that we're not going in crooked. We can't because it'll self center itself. And here we go. Okay, we'll just keep pushing this in now till it bottoms out. When it bottoms out, we should get a little bit of uh, JB Weld spurting out the top. You can feel the hydraulic. It'll spurt out the sides, those flats on the side. Okay, that is bottomed out. We're starting to flex. Let's take a look at it. Okay, we're calling this project done, and uh, this was a fun pro. I told you, when you go into the shop and you feel like you're making something, that's the time you got to do it. And here we do. We we have this pretty much exactly the way I remember that, guys. And and I'll show you how this works. You know, uh, apparently it goes into your your hand like this, and this acts as like a little turn. This you don't want knurled because you want that to spin in your palm. But this is what gives you that twist. You know, and it's. I guess he was a machinist and I just thought it was cool. Let's try it out, put a screw into some wood and see how this works. Okay, now I have it at this angle. I'm hoping you get the idea of how this works. Now you see when you put this in the hand, we engage the screw here and watch my fingers how it turns on the handle. You see that's what, you know, it's made for like machinist screws and stuff and you see how that turns in and, and then you could give it a little extra torque by, by turning the whole wrist and it's just a lovely little screwdriver, you know, and uh, I don't know. I I just love homemade stuff, and I think this is a. We did a little scout crafter red in the back there. Can you see it? A little scout. Crafter. So there we have it. A little something different. Hopefully it'll get you uh, maybe designing and making your own tool. You know, with a screwdriver or something. Again, these are so cheap. You can't you can't avoid but taking these and and, and just making any kind of handle. Uh, fun project. Okay, in closing, that was a uh, fun project. I hope you had fun uh, watching along, and thanks very much for tuning in. Have a great weekend. Take care now. Bye bye.